Good evening. This is George Herman of CBS Radio News recording in Washington. The ninth day of the hearings into the dispute between Senator McCarthy and the Army produced more speech-making and less new evidence than almost any other session to date. The speeches were touched off by executive sessions of the subcommittee, one last night and one this morning, and by parallel meetings between attorneys Welch and Jenkins. The subject of all this conferring was, once again, ways and means of speeding things up. None were found. Instead, the hearings came to nearly a complete halt as each side and each party explained what he thought had been decided and what ought to be done. The rest of the hearing revolved largely around a letter from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to Army General Bowling and what it meant and how Senator McCarthy got hold of the personal and confidential letter in the first place. The details now and some recorded highlights from Griffin Bancroft. When the public hearings opened this morning, Chairman Munt let every member speak his piece on what boiled down to be why the hearings should be speeded up, but why they couldn't be. They all took advantage of the opportunity to make statements. Republican Senator Dirksen of Illinois started things. He explained that the role of a peacemaker is not a happy one and suggested dropping charges against Assistant Defense Secretary Struve Hensel. Dirksen said... In the course of our conversations last night and this morning... We did explore this question of whether or not the charges against Mr. Hensel might be withdrawn, probably to state it accurately, withdrawn without prejudice on either side. And uh, I, for one, believe that under parliamentary procedure, the senator from uh, Wisconsin, if he so desires, is fully within his right uh, in uh, withdrawing those charges so that at least what is before us would be reduced by one principle and whatever testimony that would require. Secondly, it occurred to me that since uh, Secretary Stevens has been on the stand now for nearly eight days, so much of the background has already been explored in direct examination and cross-examination, that probably if the senator from Wisconsin took the stand and submitted to examination and cross-examination, that it wouldn't be necessary to call uh, subordinate witnesses or implementing witnesses, and thereby we could very substantially abbreviate these hearings. Now, that was the uh, suggestion that I had in mind. That was the suggestion that I made. But I'm afraid on the basis of what must be reported this morning that it has not been altogether fruitful. But I'm going to suggest openly now, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the senator from Wisconsin is entirely within his right. Uh, if he wanted to withdraw those charges, and I think he could do so without making any amplifying explanation of any kind, so that if they were to be uh, resumed or reinstated or considered in executive session sometime later, that is a matter for the committee to decide. But he is entirely within his rights if he wanted to withdraw those charges. Secondly, it seems to me that it would be in the interest uh, of expedition, and there would be no forfeiture of truth, or uh, there would be no forfeiture of the facts in the case if the senator then took the stand and the committee uh, 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 undertook to conclude that with uh, the presentation of the testimony by Senator McCarthy, the hearing might then very well come to an end. In between the senators, Army Counsel Welch had his say. He read his suggestion for shortening the hearings by calling Senator McCarthy as the next witness after Secretary Stevens. And Welch, too, referred to last night's executive meeting. Now may I review last evening, I hope within the limits of what a gentleman may speak in respect to an executive session. There was, as every senator knows, a vote. May I inquire, Mr. Chairman, if I am at liberty to state that vote? The vote has been reported to the press. All the votes of our committee are reported to the press. It was unanimous vote to make the reading. That vote was the council confer with a view to in inventing some formula that would shorten the hearing. Mr. Jenkins will inform you, I am sure, that tired though I was, <laughs> I saw a conference last night, and Mr. Jenkins said, I think I'm as tired as you, let's try it in the morning. We met this morning at 9.15 as two, I would like to think, honorable trial lawyers meet, certainly honor on his side, and we conferred. 
We were unable to invent a magic formula for shortening the hearings, and I am confident that Mr. Jenkins so reported to the committee in my absence. I still stand on my proposition that if the testimony of Mr. Stevens is concluded and Senator McCarthy is called next, that it will greatly shorten the hearing. My good friend, Mr. Jenkins, does not share my optimism. Since he does not share my optimism, I have been forced to say that I think the American people will demand and should have the long, hard, furrow plow. I began in this case by saying I wanted all the facts presented. Consideration over the night has led me more firmly than ever to feel that must be done no matter how much time is required. And so Mr. Wells stands for the two propositions he has always stood for. First, that it will shorten the hearings if the senator is called next, and Mr. Jenkins, I regret to say, does not agree. Secondly. First, last, and always, we must plow the long furrow. Then Chairman Monk took over. He said the committee faced three alternatives, and he gave the senators the bad news. They may be around quite a while. We confront three alternatives as the chair sees it in these hearings. One is to proceed with the slow processes of adjudication in which we are now engaged. The chair would like to say that at the closed session, he asked counsel for all parties, they were all there yesterday, whether they felt that there were any rule changes that could be made in equity to all parties concerned that would expedite the hearing. No rule changes were recommended or suggested. We realize the process of adjudication is slow and laborious, and the way it now appears may require two weeks or three weeks or longer. But if that is the process to follow to get the facts, I think the facts ultimately can be secured in that direction. It's a little bit disturbing to find so many of the newspapers, so many of the people urging us to use the process of adjudication, now beating us over the head, however, because we're doing it, and because it takes time to do the thing honestly and fairly. I think I speak for the full committee when I say, if we continue with the processes of adjudication, we are not going to be stampeded into injustice because newspaper people now say we wish it hadn't been started, although it was started primarily in conformity with their recommendation. The second procedure would be the process of abdication. The committee could walk out. Nobody on the committee has suggested that. None of the counsel of any of the parties have suggested that. I'm sure such a dishonorable procedure would not be followed. The third is the process of arbitration. We tried at the suggestion that Senator Dirksen made, developing out of Mr. Welch's statement on page 1370 of the record, to bring together all of the parties for a process of arbitration, to see whether we could narrow the field, reduce the number of witnesses, or limit it, as had been suggested, as an alternative to Secretary Stevens and Senator McCarthy. Regardless of what may have been felt, may have been understood yesterday. No other motion was made. We did go around the room several times to find out whether that would expedite the hearing and secured a definite commitment from Senator McCarthy that if that proceeding were followed, he would dismiss, as far as he was concerned, Secretary Stevens this morning and assume the stand himself. It appears that that process of arbitration has not worked out satisfactorily because it is quite obvious that at least some of the parties to the discussion now feel that they would not like to follow that procedure. And here again is George Herman. As the meeting proceeded, a partisan political note began to creep in more strongly than ever before. The Democrats had a somewhat different idea about the way to expedite the hearings. Senators McClellan, Symington, and Jackson had previously found it easy to maintain almost ostentatious impartiality. But the details of this aspect of today's hearings in just a moment as we pause right here for 30 seconds to allow for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is George Herman again recording from Washington as we continue our summary of the highlights from today's session of the Army McCarthy hearings. The inquiry itself was still stalled late in the morning while the subcommittee members continued their speeches about efforts to speed up the hearings. Here again to bring you the scene is Griffin Bancroft. 
The ranking committee Democrat, Senator McClellan of Arkansas, set forth the Democratic position on the matter of speeding up the hearings. McClellan said the Democrats were caught in a crossfire, that they hadn't brought any charges, but he said the charges were so serious, everybody involved ought to testify. McClellan concluded this way. The charges and the counter charges that have been made and are still before this committee strike at the integrity of the administration of the United States Army and also at the integrity of a standing committee of the United States Senate. Now, gentlemen, in my opinion, you just can't wipe these charges off and at the same time do our duty. And I feel that at least the principle to this controversy should be heard. I hope we can expedite the hearings. This is not, this is not a pleasant task for us. It's a disagreeable task. But the paths of duty are not always pleasant. We're not responsible for these charges. There are those present who are and their principles to this controversy. And if these charges are unfounded, they go to the damaging of character and reputation of high public officials. And they should be cleared up. And Mr. Chairman, may I say to you again that the Democrats of this committee are here to be helpful and will help you expedite these hearings. And I may say that since this is on television, on radio, and before the public in open hearings, it will not be difficult for the public to detect who is guilty of dilatory tactics and who is undertaking to obstruct the hearings. And I say, Mr. Chairman, as so far as I'm concerned, I restrain myself from asking any questions except those that are directly relevant and necessary to develop the truth and to reveal that which is false. I think we're compelled to go on with the hearings. Some have said that a letter from Republican Senator Potter of Michigan requesting information brought forth the Army charges and started the whole thing. When it came his turn to speak, Potter entered a firm denial of this. He said he was trying to prevent, not to start, what he called this spectacle. He said he just wanted things in proper perspective and went on. I thought it incumbent upon the members of this committee, and certainly the majority members of this committee, who after all have to assume their responsibility as majority members. I thought it incumbent upon us to certainly have that report or chronological order of events prior to some member of the House or some other member of, of Congress receiving it and surprising us on the floor by some speech or some news conference. Therefore, I requested this report, and I received it. I believe I received the report 24 hours prior to any other member of Congress. This report was seen by four people, myself, Senator McCarthy, Senator Munt, and Senator Dirksen, and no one else. It is my understanding that this report would, was due to be issued as a result of, of the statements that have been made in the press conference to the other members of the Congress, not on this committee, or not on the majority side of this committee. The purpose of my letter was to keep from having a spectacle as we're having now. I had hoped that this controversy could have been resolved and the committee or the army take the proper action to remove if the people in the respective camps that might be guilty of misconduct. I never envisioned that we'd have praise of special attorneys. I had assumed that this is a matter that could be handled quickly and have been over with. I did not pull the trigger for this hearing. I was pulling a trigger to keep from having a hearing such as we're having now. I want that made definitely understood. And I'm sick and tired of some efforts on the part of 
some newspaper people, I assume they've been misinformed or ill-informed, who endeavor to place upon me the burden of starting this hearing. In winding up all the testimonials, Chairman Munt asked that the lawyers on all sides keep on consulting to try to find some way to speed things along. At that point, Senator McCarthy, the lawyer for his side, McCarthy insisted that Welch had reneged on the agreement to limit things to Stevens and McCarthy. Here, McCarthy starts it, Welch protests, and Munt winds it up. May I just make it clear now, when the chair says the council sits themselves together, as far as I'm concerned, I will only consult with Mr. Welch if he's under oath. I will not consult with a man who makes an agreement break. As far as I'm concerned, it's bad faith. He made a suggestion. I extended myself to accept that. And uh, I would like to know, and Mr. Chairman, I think you should consider, I'm not making a request now, but I think you should consider whether or not Mr. Welch should not be put under oath and have the committee find out what happened between the time that he said that he was willing to shorten these proceedings and this morning when he changed his mind. Uh, as I say, I'm not making the request, Mr. Chairman, but I wish you would give that some thought. The uh, chair will suggest that we now continue with the order of the day. Mr. Chair, that is Mr. not satisfactory to me, sir, that accusation of bad faith on my part. There are three, six, eight people at the head table, or at your table, who knows what went on. The allegation or the suggestion of bad faith on the part of Welsh is false, and is known to you gentlemen at the other side of the table to be false. And either the chairman or the council should add his word to mine on this point. The chair has no intention whatsoever of following the suggestion to put uh, the people who at the executive session under oath to try to determine anything further than we have been able to discuss among ourselves here in public where everybody has had his chance to say what he wanted to say on his own responsibility with no rules of relevancy, no rules of time termination, no rules of procedure applied. As the afternoon session wore on, Senator McCarthy and Chief Counsel Roy Cohn questioned Secretary Stevens about the McCarthy investigation of alleged communists at Fort Monmouth. The case of a civilian employee, Aaron Coleman, came up. He is one of those suspended, but still under investigation. Cohn charged the Army had deleted certain parts of Coleman's personnel file and read from the testimony of an executive committee hearing when he made the charge in Stevens's presence. At that point, Counsel Jenkins took over the questioning. There, Mr. Cohn made a charge to you in your presence that he asked for the personnel file on Aaron Coleman that it was shown him, that he made copious notes from it, that instead of taking the original file with him, you told him you'd send him photostats, that the photostats did not contain all of the original file, and that it had been stripped of valuable pertinent information. Now, do you recall his making a statement to you in executive session? Not of that import? No, sir, I don't recall that... Uh... I told him I was going to send him a file. I, I just don't have well, a file. the question. You heard that charge, and apparently it was a serious charge made to you uh, involving your command by Mr. Cohn on October 14th. Do you recall his making that, I might say, serious charge against you? Frankly, I don't. This, uh, this uh, transcript here, as I say, is the first time I've seen it or heard it. Then this transcript, from which I have read, does not refresh your recollection on that subject? Well, it, uh, I, I just uh, have no recollection, uh, 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 Mr. Jenkins, of handling any files at any time in regard to these matters. After this, Senator McCarthy pressed Stevens on what he called stripping the files, but it was all inconclusive. In the middle of it, the senator's ten-minute time period ran out, and Counsel Jenkins resumed the questioning. But first, Senator McCarthy. Now, do you think it was proper to strip that personnel file, not knowing, of course, not knowing that we had the notes, to strip the personnel file 
give it to us with the representation. But that was the full personnel file in this very important case. If those handling this case, Mr. Secretary, were honest, don't you think when they stripped that file, if they felt they had some reason, that then in common honesty they would send along a note saying we have removed certain material from this file? I do not think... Or do we have a different idea upon it? I don't think that they could give out uh, material affecting loyalty. I think that would... would Did you hear my question? Your time has expired. Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Secretary, I want to clarify one thing in my mind. We're talking about a personnel file on Aaron Coleman, aren't we? That's right. Now, Mr. Secretary, is that a classified or a loyalty file covered by a presidential directive, or is it not? Well, there was evidently loyalty information in it, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't ever recall having seen the file, sir, so I'd like to get somebody to testify that can give you the first-hand facts. I can't give them to you. In other words, if a personnel file contains some loyalty information, then is it your position that you would have a right to strip the loyalty information from it? Not only have a right, but you've got to do it or you violate the law. Now, who passes on where the line of demarcation is, whether it is routine personnel file that you're permitted to give to the committee or whether it is loyalty file? Who passes on that? It would either be the, the uh, G1 or the G2 of the general staff. Could you ascertain what individual, pinpointing his name, handled this Aaron Coleman file and sent either all of it or a part of it to the McCarthy Committee? Is, the, is it possible to ascertain that? I think it would be, yes, sir. How long would it take? Well, I don't know. I hope maybe we could find out by tomorrow or something if like that. If a part of that file contained information to the fact that Coleman had taken from the installation where he was working 40 odd secret documents or classified documents from the installation to his home would that be classified as a loyalty document or would it not I just can't answer that uh, Mr. Jenkins well, I've, I've, not, I've never stripped anything like that I don't know right. the, I don't know what where the line is drawn it would be the People handling these security matters that would know, and I would like to get somebody up here that handled the file and could answer your question. That's why I ask you. But I can't answer them. I don't have any first-hand knowledge of it. Who did it? If it was stripped, as has been charged here now, uh, in uh, in uh, substantiating the charge of uh, the McCarthy Committee that you did not cooperate in uh, their investigation of uh, personnel at Fort Monmouth, if it were, if it were stripped of a part of that file, would it, is it your policy when such a thing occurs and a personnel is sent to this investigating committee to advise the committee that it's not the complete file, but that there has been deleted from it certain loyalty information? Is that, what is your policy? I think the... I think the committee would understand that, uh, Mr. Jenkins. I think they'd understand that we do not give out and cannot, under existing presidential directives, give out loyalty information. I well, think now, the committee understands that. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Cohn charged on October 14th that he had seen that fact, that he had made copious notes from it. If it contained loyalty information, then would it not have been violating the directive if you had permitted him to look at it with his own eyes? I think it would have been, Mr. Jenkins. So there was, if there was a presidential directive covering it, it was violated initially prior to or on October 14th. That's, in my opinion, that's a correct statement. Then McCarthy and Cohn insisted Stevens or someone had written them a letter acknowledging things were withheld from the files. Cohn said he couldn't find his copy of the letter and demanded the Army to produce its copy. After quite a bit of wrangling, it developed the letter had been written by Army Counsel John Adams. So he was sworn in and read the letter, Adams to McCarthy. Dear Mr. Chairman, it is understood that a representative of the Civilian Personnel Office at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, made available to members of the staff of your committee 
the entire personnel file on Aaron H. Coleman, despite the fact that the file in question contained information relating to loyalty and security investigations and procedures, which the Army is prohibited by presidential directive from transmitting outside the executive branch. When this file was photostatted and sent to the Department of the Army in Washington for transmittal to your committee, photostats of those documents relating to loyalty and security matters were withdrawn in accordance with customary procedure established pursuant to the presidential directive. Accordingly, the photostats sent to your committee were not as complete as the original file, which members of your staff had already inspected. Since the prohibition against furnishing loyalty and security information outside the executive branch has already been violated in the Coleman case by action at the field installation, Secretary Stevens feels that no useful purpose will be served in this particular case by withholding from your committee photostats of documents which your staff has already inspected. At the express direction of the Secretary, therefore, there are forwarded herewith photostats of six documents with accompanying attachments. Sincerely yours, John G. Adams, Department Counselor. In the lower left-hand corner are listed the six documents which were forwarded therewith. The enclosures are photostat of Form 52, Form 84, Form 72, and Form 50, each of which is a loyalty or security form. I cannot further identify them without having me in front of them in front of me. A photostat of the letter to the Commanding General Fort Monmouth from Colonel J.D. O'Connell to October 1946, which I recall as being a document having to do with the reprimand given to Coleman uh, on one occasion and a reprimand with endorsement dated 21 October 1946. That is the complete letter. There was more argument about the letter, and Army Council Welch made a point of order. The chairman got into it, and McCarthy, and finally, Council Jenkins wound it up. First, Mr. Welch. It was just by accident that I was able to find this revealing letter in this courtroom. Except for my ability to find it, or more accurately, for the ability of the men behind me to file it, we would have floundered around in accusations against Stevens in respect to a letter that he never wrote, but which, when produced, ended all the foolishness and got this hearing back on the wheels. Now, I, I agree with Senator Simon, and there just makes no sense to talk to Secretary Stevens about letters when it turns out, A, that Cohn has lost them, and B, that when we find the copy, Stevens didn't write it. The chair would like to remind the council that uh, when Secretary Stevens stated that the letter was written by Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams is called to the stand. I quite agree. Said he did write the letter. You produced the letter. That's the way to make headway. Uh, Mr. Cohn or uh, uh, Senator McCartney? May I see the letter, please? Mr. Adams, may I ask you this question? To complete the record, Mr. Adams, I ask you to file that letter as an exhibit. I think it's all right. Number 13 has been filed. Mr. Adams, may I ask you a question? You have heard uh, Mr. Welch just refer to this as foolishness. Would you consider it foolishness to have a file stripped and not tell the committee it is stripped, presented to the committee as a complete file? Or you told the letter? committee by this letter that it had been stripped, Senator. Well, it, after we caught you red-handed, then you gave us the material. Well, let's see if it isn't true. Let's see if it isn't true. You didn't give us this material until after we cut, we told you that our notes showed the file had been stripped. Up till that time, you sat in the room, did you not? Knew we had the file? Knew we were questioning Mr. Coleman on the basis of that file? Never raised your voice and told us the file had been stripped? Senator, as I recall, there was no time during the fall or winter during my negotiations with you and Could your staff when I failed to tell you that we always took from the Mr. file loyalty and security information. Mr. I never kept that a secret from Mr. Chairman, may Mr. I remind the chair that Mr. Adams was put on the witness stand at this time out of order for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to identify and introduce in the record the, let copy, the letter 
sent to Senator McCarthy on October 15th. Then the matter of another letter came up. This one, written back in 1951 to Army Intelligence by FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover. There was a great deal of argument about this letter. It had been developed that the FBI was investigating personnel at Fort Monmouth before Stevens took office. But McCarthy said these reports were still in Army files and Stevens ought to know about them. McCarthy started this way. Did you either see or get a report from your subordinates in regard to FBI uh, repeated reports on certain personnel in the Fort Monmouth Laboratory. I know that uh, we were in very close touch with the FBI at all times on Fort Monmouth. Now, that is why I am raising this question. Ordinarily, I wouldn't bring the FBI into this, but you've tried to leave the impression that perhaps it was the FBI. I expect that. I shouldn't say you tried to leave the impression. I'm afraid you may have left the impression, Mr. Secretary, that the FBI was derelict in this duty. Oh, well, because if I did, I, I, I wish to immediately correct any such insinuation. Good. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you do, because I think we both agree that they've been doing a good job. Now... Yes, sir. I would like to, Mr. Secretary, give you a letter, uh, one which was written incidentally before you took office, but which was in the file, I understand, during all the time you were in office... I understand this in the file as of today, from the FBI, uh, pointing out the urgency uh, in connection with certain cases, listing the fact, for example, that uh, Coleman had been in direct connection with an espionage agent. Mr. Mark- Chairman, uh, Senator McCarthy, I think it only fair to this witness that you first establish the fact by him, if such is the fact, that that letter was in his file at the time he came into office and during his tenure of office. Well, the committee got into a wrangle over this letter from J. Edgar Hoover, which, by the way, never did get introduced in evidence. Democratic Senator Jackson asked how the committee was able to get hold of a confidential FBI letter. McCarthy said it didn't come from the FBI, and Army Counsel Welch was equally insistent it didn't come from Army files. Welch said he was consumed with curiosity as to where the McCarthy committee got it. But Chairman Munt ruled that investigating committees do not have to disclose sources of information and told Welch he would have to satisfy his curiosity elsewhere. Counsel Jenkins read the letter to himself and held it was relevant. Neither Welch nor Stevens would even read it to themselves unless they had Hoover's permission. After much of this, McCarthy resumed questioning Stevens. Let me ask you this question, Mr. Secretary. Has it been brought to your attention that there are a series of warnings from the FBI in regard to the situation at Fort Monmouth? And that those warnings were disregarded until the committee started its hearing for its investigation? No, sir, that last part is not right. And we in the Army have been in contact with the FBI in respect to Fort Monmouth over a long period of time. Right. Now, I would like to give you the chapter and verse on that, but there again I feel that I should have Mr. Hoover's permission to do so. Well, if you would just try and answer my question. You say you've been in contact with the FBI. That's I right. ask you the simple question. In view of the fact there were no suspensions and we started our investigation, were you warned continually and constantly, you and your predecessor, in regard to many of the people who were suspended after we started our investigation, including Aaron Coleman? Like Aaron Coleman. There were suspensions before you started, Senator McCarthy, as far as I know and believe. Well, I don't believe you got the first part of the question. Uh, the chair again suggested the senator to ask one question at a time instead of two or three in the same phrase. It'll be easier for the secretary, easier for the committee. It'll help to expedite the hearing. Will you reread the question, please? Will the, will the chairman quit browbeating the council? <laughs> I'll rephrase it and break it up and say, Mr. Chairman. Very difficult for the, either the committee or the secretary to get it there too. Points of view in the same question. I think uh, I think the chair makes a good point. I think the question may have been too long for the secretary. Uh, 
Mr. Mr. Secretary, are you aware of the fact that the FBI sent a series of warnings to your department in regard to the security situation at Fort Monk? Yes, sir. Uh, and they named a sizable number of individuals in the warnings as dangerous to the security. Is that correct? Yes, but I'm not prepared to go into individual cases. I don't want you to. I don't want you to. But they did give you a list of names of like men they considered uh, as dangerous in that secret work. Is that correct? That's what FBI communications usually deal with. Well, not did, did, did they in this case? Oh, yes. Soon after this, McCarthy's time again expired, leaving a question dangling. But Monk ruled it was time to adjourn. First, Senator Dirksen had a point of order. And as the day began, so it ended on how to do something to speed things up. Dirksen's final suggestion that also was left unsettled was for more sessions each day and each week. Just before adjournment, Dirksen asked. Now, Mr. Chairman, would you like to entertain uh, any suggestion about night sessions and Saturday sessions in the interest of expedition? The chair is perfectly willing to have a conference. The chair is perfectly willing to meet nights and Saturdays, as far as the chair is concerned, if that will help to expedite the hearings. As usual, he is the creature of the uh, desires of his committee, which he hopes will continue to be conveyed to him unanimously. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Welch, I think that's a point on which both Mr. Jenkins and Welsh, who is five years older than Mr. Jenkins, would like to be heard. It's pretty hard going to prepare your facts at night, try in the day, and then have an evening session, and I think... Senator McClellan would not be without some interest in the poor trial lawyer that certainly gets awful tired. May the chair, chair inquire of you, Mr. Welch, whether in the interest of expedition it's necessary to spend more hours in the hearings, whether you would prefer and whether Mr. Stevens would prefer, because he has also been subjected to a lot of fatigue, whether you would rather have hearings on Saturday or in the evening. Hearings on Saturday are equally repulsive because the chair knows my lovely habit of going back to my home. My own view is that if you if you put in the number of hours we're putting in, you'll do about as much good as if you flog your minds when you're tired trying to prove something. You get into wrangles. My observation about night sessions is that my temper is short and that of other people. I am just opposed as the Dickens to night sessions and equally opposed to Saturday sessions, but I have said before, mine is a small voice. If I have to do it, I will hitch up my suspenders one more notch and I'll do it, but I hope I don't have to. <laughs> we stand, I stand in recess until 10.30, but the chair believes we may have to have both night sessions and Saturday sessions if we don't move more rapidly than we now are. So, as often happens, the chairman had the final word, and also, as often happens, no decisions were made. And now, here again is George Herman. Tomorrow will be the tenth day of the hearings, and they'll open once again with Armit Secretary Stevens on the stand at the insistence of Senator McCarthy. The senator is embarked upon a line of cross-examination, which is, in actual effect, a new investigation into the cases at Fort Monmouth, and a new attempt to prove that the army coddled communists. CBS Radio will bring you recorded highlights from the hearings again tomorrow night at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. Please note that new time. It's 20 minutes earlier than tonight's report. It will start at 10 o'clock tomorrow night Eastern Time. News conference at the Pentagon today. Newsmen asked Defense Secretary Wilson about Stevens. No comment until the hearings are over. George Herman reporting in Washington. This is the CBS Radio Network.